Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Please stand, greet your neighbor, tell them you're happy they're here this morning. It's nice and dark, so no reason to be uh, embarrassed. I'll praise in the valley, and I'll praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, and praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when outnumbered, and praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water.
beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. didn't want heaven without us so jesus you brought heaven down my sin was great your love was greater what could separate us now what a wonderful name what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name. God's there with me. And when I meal prep, God's sitting in the kitchen with me. 
And when I drive my car anywhere, God rides in the car with me. When I go to the park and I go on my walk, God walks with me. And when I go to the gym, I don't work out alone because this is the personal God that we serve. So our God is big, yes, but he's also so intentional. And if you think that this is the only place God wants to meet you, you're missing out on so much God has for you because this was never meant to be a religion. And we say that over and over, but if you're coming to church once a week and that's the only time you connect with God, that's a religion. Let me tell you, God has so much more for you. He wants a relationship with you. That means he wants to be in the middle of your good days. He wants to be right in the middle of your ugly days. He wants to be right in the middle, this one blew me away, of your ordinary days. Your normal days, nothing good, nothing bad, just going through the motions. You know what? God wants to be right in the middle of those days because he loves you. He loves you so much and he cares about every little detail of your life. Nothing's too big and nothing's too small for our God. So would you just invite him into every area of your life? Right where you're at, would you just pray to God? Would you just invite him in this space? God, Holy Spirit, would you just fill our hearts? Would you fill this room today? We did not come to this room to be marking something off the list. God, we came for you. Would you come and meet us in this space this morning? We're so desperate for you. We need you, Jesus. And then would you pray for the rest of your week that God would just walk with you? That when you're at work, God, would you meet us in our workplaces when we go home to the crazy children? God, would you help us to feel your presence? Every step, every move we make, God, would you teach us how to be closer to you, Father? We want to walk in relationship with our Creator. And everywhere we go, we need you, Jesus, not just today. But Monday through Saturday, we need you just as much. And then, of course, would you pray for the people in your life that need Jesus? Would you pray for the people that are struggling, that are going through things? God, we pray for all the people around us. We pray for our families. We pray for our people that we go to work with, that we come in contact with. be a light for, through us this week, God, every person we come in contact with, would they see that you are living inside of us and you're walking this life out with us. We thank you so much for today, God. We thank you for every way that you're going to move through this service. And we thank you for every way that you're going to move throughout this week. Now that we're expecting you to meet us in every atmosphere of our lives, God, would you just draw close to us today? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you all stand up and worship your intentional God this morning? I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness 
of God.
Well, good morning. It's good to be back with you guys this morning. I love our decoration for the new theme, Unraveled, because it reminds me of growing up. I used to have several cassettes. I would record all night long uh, the top 40 or whatever. And, uh, you know, sometimes the cassette would get a little messed up. And for those of you that know what a cassette tape is, the only way to get them rewound was with a number two pencil. And uh, you stuck that thing in there, and you wound that back up. Now, sometimes my cassette tape might split somewhere along the way, and I had to get some, uh, what's that, clear tape? Scotch tape, and cut a little piece and kind of work it in there and kind of maneuver that. And it would still play. It would just skip that little spot. And, uh, but it was, it was pretty awesome that there could be restoration in the unraveling. I, I, we're going to spend some time this this month, we're going to talk a little bit about bad unraveling, but we're, sometimes it's okay that we get a little, un, a little unraveled, right? Like, uh, but today I want to talk about when the unraveling is out of our control. Like when things happen to us, not necessarily because of something I did. You ever been there? You were just a part of it, and it just happened to you. You didn't plan on it. You didn't sin to make it happen. It just happened. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to preach the entire book of Job today. Now, how many of you all know I was 42 chapters or something like that in it? So hold on. I'm going to try to get done before a second service comes in here. But you guys hold on to your seatbelts. Open up to Job chapter 1. We're going we're gonna to hear about this guy, Job, who was a righteous man. That's the way the Bible describes him to us. That in God's eyes, he was doing what was right. Here's how the Bible says it. Job chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man named, whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. He had seven sons, three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all of the people of the East. This guy was wealthy. Uh, God had been blessing him. He had everything he could ever want, great family. He had all these uh, cattle and sheep and livestock. He had it all. And then we hear in verse 6, One day the angels, they came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came to them, or came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Now we're assuming that Satan has already been cast out of heaven, but we're also finding out right here that Satan can kind of come and go. He's not there to live, obviously. He's been kicked out. And so it reminds me in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, where he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and wickedness and evil in heavenly realms. It's kind of like another idea that we're seeing here that Satan went before the Lord. Where God is, that's heaven. You all with me so far? He goes, he stands before him. And the Lord says to Satan, have you, con oh, Satan answered the Lord. They said, where have you come from? And Satan answers the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Now, I remember I went to the army uh, in 1995. And I remember people telling me, listen, Rusty, when you get to boot camp, you don't want to be noticed. You want to make sure they don't even know your name. Like, just lay low. And they called me Smiley because I couldn't quit smiling. When those guys would say something, I thought it was funny. But they didn't think it was funny that I thought it was funny. So they ended up knowing my name. And uh, I got lots of extra push-ups for that. But I'm sure Job kind of felt that way. Had he had known that God said this, have you considered my servant Job? Like, if you haven't seen him while you've been out there roaming around Satan, have you seen Job? Here's why he says it. There is no one on earth like him. Would it be something for God to brag about you and me like this? For him to say to Satan, you can't, you can't make this guy stumble. He's blameless. He's upright. He's a man who fears God and he shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything that he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and his herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything that he has. 
and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan very well, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. The big idea today is that even in hardship, God is in control. Now, as you look on your listening guide, i got to be real careful as I begin to share this with you because I don't want to mislead you in any way. The very first thing on your listening guide is we don't have the ultimate control. Well, the Bible says in Proverbs 19, 20, 21, that in a man's heart are many plans, but God's purpose prevails. Well, that only makes sense for the believer. Because see, A believer, that's who God's talking to. Job is a believer. He fears God. He shuns evil. In a man's heart are many plans, but God's purpose prevails. Only if we're people that have, the believer is one who has a surrendered heart. That is said, not my life, but your life. Not my will, but your will be done. I I believe that I can go down my own road, and I can have control, and the Lord will give me over to my deprived way of life. Depraved way of life. That, that I, I'm not living for God, but when, when I surrender my life, now that means I no longer have control. Everybody with me? So he has ultimate control if I've died to myself. Galatians 2.20, Paul says it this way. I have been crucified with Christ. He's talking about dying to self. He's saying I no longer want control. He says I no longer... I live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, Paul says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So now, Rusty, Christ has ultimate control in your life because you have surrendered your life to him. You know, whenever I go about doing things I shouldn't do, I'm going to tell you, Paul says, should I go on sinning so grace may abound? He says, by no means, you've been created to do good things, therefore do them and glorify God. He says, if you've died to your sin, how can you continue in it any longer? Listen, this is where God has control. He is going to make me miserable. Anybody else ever been there? Felt guilty before? When you're not doing what you ought to be doing, that it begins to convict your heart, the Holy Spirit of God, that he begins to help lead you in the right path to change and to turn your life around for him. But as believers, let me say this, you and I, we're going to face hardships anyways. Man, when God said, I'm here for you and I got control, I think of the disciples. He didn't allow them to go around the storm. They went through the storm with Jesus. Jesus takes our hand of faith and we walk with him in faith. That's why it says that, the, that the, the, the Christian will walk by faith and not by sight. We're going to have troubles. James chapter 1 verse 1 says that we're going to have troubles. Jesus' little brother James, right? He says this. James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. He's talking to the people of God. He says this, Consider a pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kind. Oh, hallelujah, the tractor broke down this week. Oh, hallelujah, there's a tire blew off the trailer today, or not this day, today, but this last week, and hit another car going down the road. True story. Praise the Lord, I have emotional uh, uh, things going on with other folks, and maybe it's within your family, and maybe it's uh, within your work, and, and all kinds of struggle and trials. Consider it pure joy. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. You know, I, I've met people that are better at this than me. I mean, like, they could hit their hand with a hammer, and they'd be like, praise the Lord. I think I'll hit my hand again. Anybody ever? I mean, I want, I mean, I may not, I don't want you to know what's going on in my brain when I hit my hand with a hammer. Y'all would just get out of my head. Y'all with me? Consider a pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. 
Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. In other words, through these trials, as we see God walk with us, we begin to understand that he will never leave us nor will he forsake us. He's always with us, and he is ultimately in control. That what the devil intends for bad, God can use for good. In the middle of your struggle, know that God has got you. Will you keep trusting God? Here's the second thing I want you to see this morning. If nothing else remains, God remains. Job 1, 13 through 22, we carry on with the story. We begin to watch how God has released Satan. He's told him, go on, go, go get. <laughs> you can't hurt him. <clears throat> But I'm going to show you that, oh, Job, he's not going to forsake me. I'm going to show you that, that Job loves me more than he loves you, more than he loves the world, more than he loves things. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and he said the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabians, they attacked and made off with them. They put the servant to the sword and I am... The only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger came to him and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger came to him and said, The Chaldeans, they formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put your servants to the sword. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, (laughs) y'all with me so far? You ever had a day you thought, could it get any worse? Look at the person next to you and say, yep, it can. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came to him and said, your sons and your daughters, they were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house and it collapsed on them and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And at this... Job got up, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, he fell to the ground in worship. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will depart. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And in all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. The rest of Job goes on. He has some friends, so-called friends, that begin to say, man, what did you do, Job? You must have really sinned against God for God to be doing this to you. You should denounce your relationship with God. You shouldn't follow a God like this that would do such a thing to someone who's been as good as you've been to God. First it was this, then it was that. I find myself sometimes looking up to heaven saying, really? (laughs) This too, God? You know, whenever I go on a trip, everything breaks at home. Maybe you're a dad and you've been on a trip before and left the family at home and you get a phone call that the washing machine stopped and Oh, when you get home that something's leaking underneath the countertop. And, 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 the, and, and your boy was out mowing with the lawnmower and he hit something with the blade and somehow the blade is like at a 90 degree that it's not supposed to be at anymore. And you got five more phone calls from people at work that the, everything that could go chaotic at work is going chaotic at work. And you stand back and you say, Lord, Really? And in that moment, it's like you can't see anything good. But when we praise God, when we say, God, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's like Job knew something that many of us miss. What we have is from God. What we have is for God. No matter what, praise God. What are we praising? Hebrews chapter 12, the 
chapter of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 and then leading into chapter 12, the first three verses speaks of others, not just Job, that are witnesses like this. These are people who have been there, done that, got the t-shirt, just like many of you sitting here today. If you were to reach out in front of you and touch somebody in front or somebody behind you or to the side, they might be going through what you're going through right now. And the good news is they made it. <laughs> Amen. And you get to make, you're going to make it. You say, Rusty, you don't know how bad my life is. You don't know what's going on in my life. And by the way, let me say this. A retribution gospel teaches that because we do something wrong, God punishes us. But that's not the gospel we preach. The gospel we preach from the word of God says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That he loves us even though we're sinners, that he has good, not harm, meant for us. So hang in there. Here's what he says, Hebrews chapter 12, 1. Here's the, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us, the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. He is saying, hang in there. God is our constant. When everything else, when our friends abandon us, when our friends turn against God, when, when, when our loved ones won't walk with, with us in those kind of things, when, when all things seem to come apart, God remains. Deuteronomy 31.6 says this, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord, your God, goes with you. There he made it personal again, like last week. The Lord, your God, goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. When you face trials, failures, struggles, broken friendships, financial hardships, just hang in there. If nothing else remains, God remains I get it. I know how hard it can be sometimes. Here's the last thing this morning. God still has good plans for you. Job 42, if you jump all the way to the end of the book of Job. Starting in verse 10, after Job had prayed for his friends. I love that. <laughs> the very first line. After he prays for his friends. I mean, so often we get caught up in our mess and all the stuff that's going on. And man, I'm going to tell you, we, we don't see just chapters that went by. We see years that have gone by where it didn't feel like God was answering his prayers, where it didn't feel like God was showing up in his life. But he remained faithful to God. He was not going to turn on God. And sometimes we think when we pray, God's like an ATM machine, like he's going to spit out the answer right now. But there's some work through. And after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. He gave him twice as much as he had before. All of his brothers and his sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his home. They comforted and consoled him over all of his trouble. The Lord had brought on him and each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life, more than the former part, he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters, and the first daughter's name was Jemima, the second was Kezai, and the third, Karen Hapak. Now, nowhere in all of the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so Job died an old man and full of years. You know, I was thinking as I was reading this story, it's awesome to see how God blessed him with materialism and how he blessed him with a family because if you've got family, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Family is a blessing. Sometimes, you know, moms and dads, when they're teenagers, I get it, they may not feel like a blessing. And teenagers, sometimes your mom and dad might not feel like a blessing, but they're a blessing. You're a blessing to one another. 
I don't think he forgot about his first sons and daughters whenever God granted him new sons and daughters. I, I, don't, think he, I, don't, I don't think he just went on life thinking that that didn't part of his life. Didn't he? No, he was still uh, remembering them and God has just come behind him and God is lifting him up. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God tells his people, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God is saying there are better days ahead. There are better things to come. I needed this message for myself this week. I told you guys last week, man, what a crazy week. The week before that, crazy. I couldn't even begin to name all of the unraveling that it felt like was occurring. But it's like God took a number two pencil and stuck it right in there and started winding that baby up. And everywhere he needed that tape, he was redeeming it. He was at work behind the scenes when I couldn't see him at work. Y'all with me? When, when I didn't know that he was hearing my prayer, when I didn't know that he was hearing my cry, God was doing his thing. And maybe he's doing his thing in your world and you don't even know it. Maybe you don't know the unraveling that's about to happen, but God is already in front of it. And God has already got an answer. And you may not know the answer. You may not even know the unraveling, but God is in control. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy your life. That's what Satan was about in the beginning of the story. Roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. The good news is greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. John 10.10, 10, if it just ended there, that would be tragic. But Jesus goes on to say in 10.10, 10, But I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. I've got good plants for you. That's what God says. When you leave this place this morning, I need you to know, eh, I'm not trying to be your cheerleader. I'm telling you, His word is true. And we can stand on His word that He's got good plans for you and your family. John chapter 14, 1 through 3. Jesus told His disciples, do not let your heart be troubled. Why? Because they're troubled. And our decide, we're troubled today. We're troubled at the state of our, our, our nation. We're troubled at the state of the, of the world today, aren't we? We're troubled at the state sometimes of what the church is like. But he's telling his disciples, listen, I got good plans for you. Don't let your heart be troubled. Remember the God of Jacob, Esau, Isaac. He said, you believe in God? Believe also in me. If you've seen the Father, you know the Son. If you've seen the Son, you know the Father. They are one, right? You believe in God, you believe also in me and my Father's house. Our many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I have a better place. I have good plans for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go and I prepare that place, then I'm going to come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, you will be also his plan. Way better than our plan. There's a day coming, friend, that you won't have to worry about your next bill. Your next meal. Your next argument. The strife that might be. Because Jesus will wipe every tear from our eye. He will restore and give us all things good. As his reward. Amen? That's our hope. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. And certain of what we do not see. So when other people are looking at you like. Your friends. And they're saying your world is unraveling. You can smile and say. The Lord giveth. And the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Lord we love you. God we thank you. We praise you this day. God, you are mighty. You are good. Father, today I pray that you would guide us, that you would direct us. God, we know that you walk with us in the park. You work out with us in the gym. God, we know that, that, that you're with us when we're meal prepping or when we're cleaning our house. So God, even though we feel oftentimes like you're not here, or maybe that you don't hear us, forgive us, God, for that. 
God, let us walk with confidence knowing that we are your children and you have what's best in mind for us. God, let us consider a pure joy when we face trials. Knowing that, God, you might look at Satan someday and go, have you considered Rusty? Have you considered Angie? They're going to stand for me no matter what. God, we love you. God, we thank you and we praise you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. This is an invitation. If you would stand with us. Maybe you're going through it today. It's been a month. It's been a week. It's been a day. And it's not even 930 yet. And you just need prayer. Friend, we get it. Come pray. God is here for you. If you need to surrender your life to him and say, man, I've made a mess out of this life. God, if you can do something with it, here it is. I want you to be in control of my life. Today you can do that. You come as God leads you right now. Come on, friend. When the storm is raging all around me, you are the peace that calms my troubled sea. And when the cares of this world darken my day, you are the light that shines and shows me the way. Oh, the beauty of your majesty. On the cross you showed your love to me. Beautiful Lord, awesome and mighty, I'm captured by this love I see. Beautiful Lord, tender and holy, your mercy brings me to my It's your mercy that has made me free, beautiful Lord. And when my sin is all that I can see, your grace remains the shelter that I see. And when my weakness is all I can give, your gentle spirit gives me strength again. Oh, the beauty of your majesty. On the cross you showed your love for me, beautiful Lord, awesome and mighty, I'm captured by this love I see, beautiful To my knees. You got me, Scott. There you go. Great message this morning on Job. Uh, we're going to take an offering at this time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, just so thankful for the many blessings that you've given us, Lord. Just bless this offering, multiply it for your use and your service. In your name we ask these things. Amen. Great to see each and every one of you this morning. It looks like it's going to be a great day out there today. Uh, if you didn't pick up a listening guide, make sure you grab one. Uh, June the 30th, uh, we're having a family day out at the fairgrounds. Uh, we'd love to have you all be a part of that. It's a Sunday afternoon from 3 to 7. Bobby and the Bobettes, or the praise team, are going to are going to be performing for us, and we'll just have a great time of food, fun, and fellowship, but we'd love for you all to be a part of that. 
Uh, if you could and had a little bit of time, we're, we're seeking some volunteers to kind of help with that, to kind of host some of that. Uh, get with Darla or my wife, Brenda, and, and we'll hook you up But if you'd like to be a part of that. But uh, like I said, we're planning on about a thousand people there is where all three congregations are going to come together. Uh, you may not know who goes to third service if you attend the first service. So we thought it'd be a good time to get together and actually meet everybody in the church. Uh, we're also inviting the Fulton campus in also, so it should be a good time. So we'll have a great time there. Uh, number five on there, Gals of Promise. Uh, Mary asked me to announce this. They're going to meet at 11 o'clock instead of 9 o'clock if you attend the Gals of Promise. And it'll be over at Bandanas. I think they're going to have a barbecue lunch over there or whatever you'd like, salads or whatever. But uh, I think it'd be a great time. But that is on Thursday the 6th at 11 o'clock at Bandanas. That's the only change to the uh, listening guide. John, do you have anything else, buddy? Hey, have a great day. Enjoy the band and see you next week.